right. Welcome, everyone. Appreciate everyone coming out to uh, our glaucoma grand rounds today and uh, know people online as well. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, so today, just as introduction um, and kind of an update is where the glaucoma division stands in 2024. So certainly we're part of the Alan Crandall Center for Glaucoma Innovation, which is uh, just a, a great thing that uh, has been put together and is gaining momentum all the time. And uh, as you know, Dr. Ike Ahmed is the director of that uh, of that institute and um, kind of has these uh, pillars of, uh, of uh, you know, as parts of that uh, Crandall Center, we have glaucoma therapeutics and surgical innovation and, and Dr. Ahmed himself uh, leads that group. And we have translational research with Dr. Hegeman and, and neuroprotective based therapies with Dr. Krizai and global care uh, directed by Dr. Chaya. And then we have our clinical division, which is what we're gonna focus on today. Um, our current clinical division, let's see if I can get this to go forward here. How about if I click that? There we go. So our current uh, clinical division consists of these eight folks and uh, it's certainly my great pleasure to be able to work with them. It's really a fantastic group and uh, just super dedicated people and, and fantastic colleagues. Um, we're also very happy to announce that, uh, I know, not announce, but uh, recognize that Dr. Ian Pitha is going to be joining us this summer in August, and he's just going to be a great addition, already a well-established uh, researcher and clinician, and and he's going to be very focused on um, glaucoma innovation, surgical innovation, and spend the majority of his time uh, doing research in the uh, Crandall Center and have a cl clinical presence as well. And uh, as always, we have our great fellows, Cole and Tim, who are here. They've just done a fantastic job and uh, getting amazingly near the end of their year. Can't believe it, it's gone by fast, but uh, they've just been fantastic. We have two others coming in who um, I think will be really, really excellent as well. We're looking forward to having them start. And then Catherine Johnson, our research fellow, has just been amazing, done a great job for us this year. And uh, she's been so amazing, we gotta have two people to replace her. So we're gonna have two fellows coming in uh, to do research full time uh, next year. So we're very excited about that. Um, as far as the division and just clinically, um, you know, over the past five years, we've had a growth rate of about 3%, and that includes the pandemic time, so it, you know, it kind of skews things a little bit. But uh, we had just over 21,000 clinic visits in fiscal year 2023 as a division. Uh, our new patients increased by a greater amount, 11% uh, annual growth rate during that same time period. And then our surgical volume increased about 2% annualized over that same five-year period. And, and um you know, just as I mentioned, so we during that five-year period in terms of surgery, we had the pandemic and then obviously the unfortunate passing of Dr. Crandall. And then I retired from doing surgery during that time. So I think the fact that that growth rate stayed positive during all that in terms of surgery is a real credit to the other uh, faculty and colleagues who have been doing surgery and, and continuing to really have a large surgical load. So that's just kind of our clinical uh, and uh, uh, clinical endeavor and also doing a lot of clinical research. I don't mean for you to read all of these, but just as a summary of uh, some of the preclinical projects that are going on within our division, and we have several of them and the clinical trials that uh, we're a part of right now and uh, very active uh, in, in that. And then uh, as well, just some of the investigator initiated protocols that are being done by various faculty members. This is not an exhaustive list, but uh, certainly just shows um, uh, a lot of interest and a lot of activity in, in terms of research within our division on the clinical side, let alone all of the other basic science work that's going on within the Crandall Center. So, you know, that's just a, kind of a brief overview of the Glaucoma Division 2024, and we're excited about the future. And the one thing that seems certain is that there's gonna be plenty of patients. Um, there's nothing but glaucoma. You know, they say, they say in the United States there are 3 million uh, patients with glaucoma, and I would say there's 3 million in the greater Salt Lake City area. Um, I just, I don't understand that number. I really don't. And there's been many who have said that's really underestimating. But one of the things about uh, glaucoma, not only do we have an aging, um, you know, U.S. population in general, but just immigration patterns, uh, you know, from the African continent, from uh, Latin America, from Eastern Europe, all of those populations have significantly higher rates of glaucoma than uh, the white population. So it, there's just a lot of glaucoma around. So it's gonna be a busy, 
few decades, uh, at least, for glaucoma specialists. So uh, hopefully we'll be ready to meet the challenge of uh, the needs around here. So I'd like to just, uh, we're going to have the very case-based uh, presentations today. And so I'd like to present one just absolute bread and butter glaucoma care that if you take care of glaucoma uh, patients, uh, you're all going to face uh, this uh, kind of in this spectrum of, of issue that I'm going to present today. So we've got an 85-year-old man uh, with a quite severe primary open angle glaucoma. He has dense superior arcuates in each eye. And I first saw him in July of 2017. He was already on Lumigan and Dorzolamide Timolol. His pressures were about 10 and 12. And though advanced, he seemed pretty stable. And so we just followed him along and, uh, and he seemed to be doing okay. He lives actually uh, in another state, so he's quite a ways away. So I was kind of managing him with his local optometrist as well, but I was seeing him very frequently. He was very good about coming down. But about two years later, both his Humphrey visual fields, right and left, uh, both looked worse. His pressure was about 14 and 17. We discussed, you know, what options might be available, uh, SLT versus another drop. And he elected to start another drop. And uh, we discussed options and he, he, you know, we jointly decided to start Repressa, but he didn't tolerate it. He was having vision changes on the Repressa. So we stopped that. And then just a short time later, we did 360 degree SLT in both eyes. His pressures at the time of SLT were 15 and 17. He seemed to have a good response. And his pressures just a few months later, kind of right before the pandemic hit, were about 11 in each eye and, and doing pretty well. And he actually did do very well for about three years or so. And um, then in May of 2023, both his visual fields again uh, looked worse. And his pressures at that time were about 13 in each eye. He had already, he was already on Lumigan and Dorzolamide Timolol. He'd had 360 degree SLT, didn't tolerate Repressa, and uh, he, he was not interested in surgery. And we're, he knows that we're starting to push up against surgery here, but he, he would rather exhaust every option. So we started Bermonidine, uh, the generic, 0.2%. We started that in May, 2023. And he came back in July just for a, you know, a pressure check, came in from out of town. Uh, you know, his pressure was a little, uh, maybe a fraction lower, but uh, we thought we'd give it a try and keep following it. So he came back for his regular visit in September of 2023, just a few months later, saying, you know, uh, my eyes, I'm kind of light sensitive and uh, they just don't feel right. And lo and behold, his pressures were 48 and 26 on those three drops. He had KP in both eyes, you know, traced to one plus anterior uh, chamber cell conjunctival injection, some hyperemia, some eyelid erythema. And um, so I have a question. What do you think he has? Any thoughts on, uh, maybe I'll, I'll exclude you two, but uh, any other thoughts about what? Uh, <laughs> any thoughts on what, what might be going on or differential uh, gene? Something like that, triage, some reaction to bromonity. Okay. Excellent. Boom. Answer. Done. We're done. That's it. That is the answer. Okay. So, you know, what are some of the other possibilities? Some of the other things you might think of just for academic purposes. Something just uveitis. It's bilateral makes, you know, herpes a little less common, but got it. That, that gets thrown into the differential of any uveitic glaucoma, but Gene is right. That is what this is. This is bromonidine induced anterior granulomatous uveitis, okay? So we're going to talk about that just a little bit later, but I want to put this into the context of just bromonidine allergy, okay? So um, alphagan bromonidine was introduced in 1996, just right after I started practice. Um, this is kind of the great age of medical treatment of glaucoma. We had, when I was a resident, like about 94, had the introduction of dorzolamide, then right after that, Alphagan, then very shortly after that, Lutaniprost. And of course, Lutaniprost was just the revolutionary drug that, that changed medical treatment of glaucoma forever. Prior to those three that came out just kind of boom, 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 you know, when I was first starting my residency in the glaucoma clinic there in Iowa, you'd be astounded at how many people were on both long-term oral Diamox and QID pilocarpine. You know, we just didn't have any other options. And so it really was a, a, an amazing time. But so Alphagan was introduced in 96 and it was introduced as a 0.2% concentration preserved with BAK. And it was plagued by 
the same problems that all of the, you know, alpha adrenergics had or the adrenergics, epinephrine, apiclonidine prior to this. And that is, and, and uh, you know, allergy. Allergy was the single biggest problem. Now, also with alpha-GAN, there was a significant amount of dry mouth complaint. Sedation was a very real thing. Um, you know, we, I, we, I think, were one of, if not the first to publish about the 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 child sedate you know the sedation of ch uh, children um, that was in 1999. I, I vividly vividly remember the call from that mother calling me saying, you know, my child has not waked up at all since we started the bromonidine about three days ago. And uh, and then I I again just got a I contacted a colleague of mine at Iowa and lo and behold they had a patient a baby in the ICU that required resuscitation from bromonidine, just extraordinary. So the sedation in infants, real, but it also can happen in adults. Very common for adults to complain of fatigue. Uh, I, and another call from a, from a daughter calling about her 90-year-old mother that said, you know, ever since we started that new drop, she's just in bed constantly and all we do is open her eyes and put the drop in. She hadn't been out of bed in three days. So um, it can really happen. But just good old allergy is really one of the main problems with um, Alphagan. So some years later, Alphagan P came out and Alphagan P actually was a genuinely superior product to the original. The concentration was cut in half and there was no BAK. There was this purite preservative. And I found just personally in my practice that Alphagan P was far better tolerated than the original Alphagan. And this is one example where in modern day, the generic, the so-called equivalent generic is nowhere near as good as the uh, brand name product, okay? The generic to get the to get the cost benefit, you have to go with a 0.2%. I think you you realize that. If you prescribe generic bromonidine in either the 0.1 or 0.15 that are available, it's as it's as expensive as brand name Alphagan. Okay, so you have to prescribe the, the 0.2. So it's twice the concentration and it comes with benzalkonium chloride. So it's really not a an equivalent product, but that's what we have. And with that kind of, especially that generic bromonidine, the allergy rate has been described as anywhere between about 5 and 25%. So it varies widely, but it's very real. The amount of time until the onset of bromonidine allergy is super variable. But probably the earliest, I mean, anything's possible, right? But the earliest you usually see it is within a few weeks to a month, but you can see it years down the line. Okay, that, that's one of the important points. And the appearance of the basic allergy is just classic allergy. You know, they have itching, they have hyperemia, they have eyelid swelling. But what I want to do is I want to emphasize this one interesting point that I think is fairly unique to bromonidine allergy, and that is it's super common for the pressure to go up. Okay, so when they get an allergy to bromonidine, and I bet you've all noticed this, when they get an allergy to bromonidine, so often their pressure kicks up as if the bromonidine just kind of stops working. All right. And um, so in a couple of papers, you know, yay at all, they described about a 6% increase with bromonidine allergy in pressure, but about a 9% if bromonidine was being used as monotherapy. Okay. Another paper, they showed a mean increase of pressure on their bromonidine patients from 20 all the way to 28 with the onset of uh, bromonidine allergy. And I've certainly seen that, you know, quite significant pressure increases when they develop a, an allergy to bromonidine. So what's the clinical implication? of that. Well, it, it, it sometimes it kind of helps you to identify which drug is the problem. You know, so often you, you, you're looking at a patient, and you say, well, that's, that's a classic allergy, right? But they're on three drops, you know, which one is it? And, uh, you know, the only way I know how to figure that out is to stop one at a time. Uh, and oftentimes, if they're on like Latanoprost, Dorzolamide, Timbalol, Bromonidine, oftentimes Bromonidine is the first one I'm pulling off anyway. But if they've had a pressure bump in their um, exam as well, I always pull off the bromonidine first. So it, it's likely the one if you've had a pressure bump. And also, it, you can kind of reassure the patient, you know, because obviously, you know, patients fixate on the pressure, just like we do. Um, and when their pressure bumps up like that, you know, and they've got an allergy, they, you know, they realize something's going on. They feel terrible, their eyes feel bad, and their pressure just bumped. And so the, the, they're really worried. But you can almost always reassure them, hey, I bet when we stop this bromonidine, not only are you going to feel better, but your pressure is going to come back down to baseline as well. And that just happens over and over and over again. So just something to be aware of and uh, something you can use clinically to help you out and then also to reassure your patient.
But let's talk about this as just a, a, a last thing here, this very specific bromonidine-induced granulomatous anterior uveitis, uh, which we saw in the, in the case report patients. So it was first described in the year 2000, a long time ago. It's been known for a long time. And in the literature, I, I didn't do an exhaustive search, but just looking through the literature, there's at least 57 cases and about 16 case reports uh, in the literature of this granulomatous uveitis. If we look at the largest report, there's about 16 patients, 26 eyes of 16 patients, and they all had ciliary injection. They all had mutton fat KP. They had AC cell universally, okay? The pressure was increased in two thirds, okay? So a very significant number. And sometimes, here's the thing, that pressure increase is profound, like in the patient that I just presented. Now, one thing about their paper, nine of their patients required surgery. That, yikes, that has not been my experience, but uh, that is what they published. And five of them were trabeculectomies. So, you know, the idea that they can have this huge bump and then not come back under control, I guess is real. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about my experience. But so what are the clinical implications of this? Well, first off, just kind of recognize this is a real thing. Okay. This is a real phenomenon, well-described. It's kind of like a pattern recognition thing. You've got pressure elevation. You've got bi oftentimes bilateral uveitis, although it can be very asymmetric. Uh, obviously, if it's, they're just using it in one eye, it might just be in one eye. Um, so recognize it. It's a real thing. And, you know, oftentimes uh, you've got this bilateral uveitic associated pressure bump. You know, you're going to think uh, of just a uveitic process. And if you want to start steroids, fine. Um, if you want to cover them with acyclovir, fine. You know, I think th those are things we do, right, when we see these types of glaucomas. But the main thing is recognize that it could all be bromonidine. So stop their bromonidine. And I I'd argue to you if they're on bromonidine and their pressure is 45 in each eye, the bromonidine is not working anyway. So just stop it and uh, let it maybe clear and, and, and see what resolves, okay? So uh, again, just an important thing to recognize. I will say for uh, people who are taking tests, residents, fellows that have boards, in the basic science series at the end of the uh, conversation about alpha agonists, there's a very short, succinct little sentence that says anterior granulomatous uveitis has been described with bromonidine. It is rare, but known. Period. So it's fair game for testing. Okay. So it's just something to be aware of. And you'll see this. I mean, I presented this one case, you know, there's 60 cases roughly in the literature, but if you're taking care of glaucoma patients, you're going to see this and you're going to see it not every day, but you're going to see it a couple of times a year. I'll guarantee you if you have a few patients on Vermontity. Sense it's not as rare as you it's not yeah i mean it's a it's a it's known and like i say how many cases have you just thought in the last year oh i can think of three right off the right off the top of my head rare. yeah that's right what is rare this is not a rare thing this is a something you will see if you've got patients on bromonidine so just as a final word i got two minutes left so in our uh, case study our 85 year old man uh, September 21st, 2023, pressures are 48 and 26. This is what we typically do. We stopped the bromonidine. We covered him with Dymox. I mean, let's get the pressure down, right? He's got severe disease. We don't want pressure in the 48s. So we started him on uh, uh, acetazolamide. We just continued his Lumigan and his Dorzolamide Timolol, thinking bromonidine was the culprit. Uh, didn't start steroid, didn't start uh, uh, antivirals. And within two weeks, his pressure was back down to 16 and 12. Uh, off of an oral CAI and just using his Lumigan and Dorzolomite Timolol. That has been by far overwhelmingly my experience with these patients, that you get them off the offending agent, bromonidine, and they just kind of resolve. Now, we still got to figure out what to do with him because his visual fields are getting worse and bromonidine is clearly not the answer. But uh, we're kind of back down to baseline now. And, uh, and he's through this episode. And thankfully, I've repeated his visual field. Thankfully, he didn't... Uh, lose ground when he spiked up this high. So anyway, uh, just an interesting thing, uh, well known, and you're going to see it. So just just be aware of it. Okay, this this spectrum of alpha agonist allergy, Bromonidine in particular, that's the one we use. Great. Any questions at all? I have a yeah. comment and question. So make a great point about generic drugs. In the glaucoma, it, it seems like there are those that are Right, and then there are those that aren't. And my question is really about those. Just if you could comment on your experience with generics that are are, are equivalent, well tolerated, yeah. 
uh, or are there still uh, medications that you're tending to lean toward the branded medication for possible? So Alphagan is the biggest example. Alphagan P, I would use Alphagan P a ton, but it is consistently over $300 for patients, even with insurance. So it's just cost prohibitive. Um, the other generics, you know, they're, they're pretty good. So the Latanoprost generic is pretty good, although there are about nine manufacturers. And I have lots of patients who feel, um, you know, that they have identified a particular generic manufacturer that works best for them. And I think that's probably quite real. But Latanoprost uh, is one that, you know, I think it's for the most part pretty good. And of course, that's the one we use the most. Uh, the Travaprost, and the bimatoprost, sometimes you don't get the price advantage, okay? That's that's one of the biggest problems with the generics. Uh, you know, okay, so Travaprost, bimatoprost, generic Combigan, th they're priced like brand names, okay? So you don't really get the, the benefit of it. So that's one of the biggest problems, I think, is the cost side. Um, just, man, it's just... You don't get as much benefit, sort of thing. But dorzolamide, uh, the dorzolamide generic is quite good. The brinzolamide generic is really quite good, but still often very, very expensive. So we end up with dorzolamide. It stings like crazy, but so does the brand name. But it's, it, but it's pretty good. But the biggest one to to know is going to be different is the bromonidine. And and to believe your patient when they feel like a specific manufacturer works best for them, because I, I I believe it it does. Now that's something they need to work out with their pharmacist. But, but, you know, usually I write a note on the prescription, you know, patient to, you know, note to pharmacy, patient has a specific manufacturer that they need to use. If you do ever see something called an authorized generic, an authorized generic is the identical original medication. It's actually generally put out by the company, has all the same inactive ingredients as well. It's relevant for Vigamox avoiding tasks, and that's why we try to use Sandoz with Vigamox probably. Yeah, very true. And now, there, just as a last word, um, so a lot of my patients who are, like require brand names and stuff, they get them through Canada. And Canada gets a lot of medicine from India. And like, for example, there's an Indian product, Alphagan Z, but it's really quite good. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's 0.1% and it's buffered and preserved with the same kind of non-BAK preservative that is in Alphagan P. Not cheap, but way cheaper than buying Alphagan P in the United States. So Alphagan Z, that's a totally legit product that I have a lot of patience on. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to turn the time over to Cole. Thank you. All right. Staying on the uveitic theme, and we'll use some more case-based example. Just talk about the challenges of managing uveitic glaucoma, particularly surgically. But first, quick shout out to the glaucoma division's first annual Green River float this year. Um, Dr. Craven, Dr. Huang snuck in there as honorary glaucoma creators. Um, <laughs> thrilling car ride discussing NDG. And Tim caught this probably 18 inch rainbow trout within 30 seconds of putting a fly in the water. And I don't think he realized that I haven't caught a fish that size in five years in Utah. <laughs> so good, good job, Tim. Um, so just to kind of lay the groundwork here, we have a young woman with uveitic versus steroid induced ocular hypertension. She came into the glaucoma division with pressure in the 30s, despite maximal medical therapy, including Diamox. Her past ocular history centers around this lupus retinal vasculitis with CME. She's gotten multiple intraocular steroid injections, though the last was about three years ago. She's had an IOL dislocate in one eye. She has a scleral fixated IOL. And she also has a history of this optic neuropathy in the left eye, which is thought to be ischemic related to possibly COVID. So her baseline vision is not great, particularly in that left eye. And of note, surgically here, she is on a blood thinner, a Coumadin, for her lupus antiphospholipid. And so she's on all the drops, Diamox, and is not tolerating that well. Her steroid was actually downgraded from Durazol to prednisolone two weeks ago. And she's on a kind of maintenance dose of systemic pred at five milligrams every day. Her exam, she came in with pressures near 38. Her vision was a little bit worse than her baseline. And then you can see the RNFL there, a little bit difficult to interpret with the ischemic event in her left eye. And the right eye also might be artificially, you know, elevated in the setting of her posterior uveitis. She was also notably open on gonia without PAS or neovascularization. 
And so previously she'd gotten up to about 30, about three years ago, managed with drops and then hung out in the twenties um, until this year when she spiked at 30 and was referred to us. And we followed her for a week, despite max medical therapy, her pressure was up near 40. So now what you're beyond the medical therapy. Um, do you consider SLT in this patient? Is she a good MIGS candidate? You know, she's pseudophagic, but could we do something standalone? considering she's also on warfarin, incisional surgery, trab or a tube, or do we consider diode, particularly in the eye that doesn't see well? And so that's kind of all the things that we're going to talk about today. Also, because of the considerations, you know, what's driving this pressure? Is it actually her uveitis, which has been inactive per us and the uveitis team, or is it all steroid-induced kind of TM dysfunction? And both eyes are high here, so are you going to address both eyes at the same time? Are you going to start with the better eye, start with the worst eye? just thinking about how to manage this. Before we get into that, just talking about uveitic glaucoma a little bit, it's a complex, you know, often overlapping mechanisms of IOP elevation. You can have both open and closed angle. Open can be acute, like a trabeculitis and a herpetic eye, or it can be more chronic, which all centers around usually TM dysfunction, either due to the inflammation and debris or steroid induced TM dysfunction, which is about a third of patients have. The closed angle mechanisms can be synechial with neovascularization or PAS or due to pupillary block, uh, either due to posterior synechiae uh, and then Bombay, or kind of a posterior uveitis causing effusion and pushing everything forward. Our patient is kind of in the chronic open angle mechanism, probably a little bit of both, steroid and TM obstruction. Um, and, and uveitis in general, it's pretty complex interplay between all these factors. When the eye is actively inflamed, this, the aqueous production actually goes down, ciliary body is inflamed, so that can lower the pressure. And inflammation also induces prostaglandin production within the eye, which can increase uveoscleral outflow, which would also tend to decrease IOP. But this is all fighting against that TM dysfunction and decreased conventional outflow. And it's also challenging to diagnose uveitics with glaucoma. As we saw, even in this patient, the cupping can be obscured by pallor, hyperemia, edema, RNFL can be artificially thick with active uveitis, also applies to macular thickness scans, and the Humphrey can also be difficult to interpret if there's any posterior involvement with the uveitis. Some might argue that you should only follow pressure and use that as a diagnostic and um, kind of what you should follow with these patients. Um, medically managing kind of centers around inflammation and IOP. This is all multidisciplinary with the uveitis team, even rheumatology, steroid, topical, periocular, intravitreal, and systemic, as well as immunosuppression. For IOP control, we talked about um, alpha agonists, so some might argue that those aren't even first line. So first line might be beta blockers and CAIs. PGAs and meiotics can sometimes worsen inflammation in CME or reactivate uveitis. So thought to be more of a second line. And then Diamox certainly has needed tem to temporize. Um, for the less invasive options procedurally, SLT has been really difficult to study in uveitic eyes because it's hard to know what's steroid and what's not. Uh, data has supported some benefit in both cases if the uveitis is quiet and it's relatively low risk of reactivation. MIGS has also been studied, but does require a good view and an open angle mechanism generally. Uh, GAT has been most extensively studied. There's one series by Chen et al. looking at 40 eyes over two years, and there was quite a substantial IOP reduction, but most of those eyes required ongoing steroids. So the conclusion was that they are essentially treating steroid response, uh, which is, you know, GAT is first line for that condition. And then kind of getting into the incisional surgeries, um, data around these traps and tubes is even harder to interpret. These are really heterogeneous uveitic diagnoses. There's lack of randomized controlled trials. Um, and it's variable, the activity of the uveitis at the time that the incisional surgery is done. So the data is really mixed. Um, I've always kind of been taught, or at least in recent years, that tubes are more first line, but TRABS had been done for many years as first line therapy for uveitic glaucoma with just the general acceptance that you're going to have lower success rates compared to primary open angle. Um, and that's because of inflammation leading to scarring fibrosis of the bleb. So there's been stories of a success and failure. Groups have found similar rates of success to POAG all the way up to 10 years. Um, there's been 90% success rates uh, in certain groups, but 
all of that seems to center around the activity at the time of surgery. If the uveitis is active, there's one group that found that even one single episode of post-op inflammation increases the risk of failure up to five times. Also, hypotony is real, even more real in these patients, it can be as high as 43%, even if the uveitis is inactive when you're doing the surgery. Risk factors for failure center around what we know for TRABS in the TVT study, active inflammation, NV, prior surgery, not using antimetabolites during surgery, all are gonna increase your risk for failure. Tubes in recent years seem to be mostly preferred uh, by most glaucoma surgeons. Uh, there was a study done at Moran uh, in 2015 looking at TRABS versus tubes, particularly the Ahmed valve. And what we found here in a retrospective study was that uh, at least at a year, uh, tubes worked better and they lasted longer, up to two years versus eight months with TRABS. And there are a couple other groups that say that, you know, you don't have as good of pressure control with Ahmed valves versus TRABS. They found that with BGI's bare belts as well, but there's also groups that have found that they work, you know, better. And then comparing the tubes, there's even less data, valved versus non-valved tubes. The general findings have been that non-valved tubes seem to work control ILP better long-term, but you have also higher rates of complications and hypotony. So going through all that, you know, it was confusing, right? What, what are you going to do if you need incisional surgery in these patients? I think a good summary is that unless the eye is completely quiet and there's no risk factors for scarring, you should do a tube. And most uveitic patients are going to have risk factors for scarring. So only if the eye is completely quiescent, or you think it's just steroid response, I think those are the patients who are good for trabeculectomy. And thinking about non-valve tubes versus Ahmed, you can get lower pressures with the non-valve tube, but you also are at higher risk of hypotony long-term. And another word on that, uh, these uveic eyes tend to trend towards hypotony, especially post-operative, um, usually because of ciliary shutdown. At baseline, these eyes are more inflamed. The, the ciliary body is um, inflamed and shut down. And then you do a surgery on top of that, which is just more toxic and it just doesn't produce aqueous. So the group mentioned earlier found hypotony rates up to 53% in trabeculectomies, 24 in bare belts and 18% in omid valves. A similar group looked at bare belts and found compared to non-uveitics, there was a 77% rate of hypotony compared to 5% in the non-uveitics postoperatively. Diode as well, um, you know, we're not turning, we're not increasing the drain we're turning off the faucet. This is an external laser to destroy ciliary body. Very high rates of hypotony inflammation, even, you know, going on to tysis bulbi in these uh, eyes. So reserved kind of as a last resort for seeing eyes end stage disease. Just for our glaucoma division, there's been some data recently kind of supporting gentler settings or micropulse diode with lower rates of hypotony. Uh, but data is very early on that as well. So anyway, quick summary back to the patient here who is in the high 30s on everything and needs some sort of procedure for her uh, high pressure and glaucoma. So what did we decide to do? With her warfarin, we decided addressing the angle and doing a minimally invasive surgery just wasn't viable. Uh, we elected to proceed with an Ahmed valve and we went in her worse eye, the, the left eye. We attenuated that tube at the time of surgery. It was uncomplicated. And then how did things go? Uh, Post-op day one, her pressure was three. Her eye was formed, but she had no bleb. Her ciliary body was completely shut down. Um, and her other eye, now off Diamox, is at 42. Two days later, her pressure is the same. She has apodositional choroidals on B-scan shown here. Still no bleb, just completely shut down eye. And so the decision was made with the pressure at 50 in her other eye to proceed with surgery to revise this hypotenuse eye, revise the tube, drain the choroidals, and then do an omid valve in her other eye, her better seeing eye during the same surgery. So just to have a little bit of gore this morning, some sort of surgical video, this is that hypotenuse eye. You can see the diffuse uh, corneal folds here. And we elected to attenuate this tube kind of just by plugging it. So this is a 3-0 proline that we blunted with low temp cautery. And then just with micro instruments, thread that within the lumen of the tube in the anterior chamber. Just to show our struggles here, you can see how long that was. When you put it in the tube and it's that long, it can misdirect the tube so it's hard to tell here, but it was just pointing straight up towards cornea. 
And so we actually removed it and then made it shorter um, to try to correct that. I don't have a ton of experience with attenuating tubes versus with this method versus, versus actually, you know, ligating or tying off the tube, but we'll see in this case, it, it worked very well. Um, so tied off, or I'm sorry, rethreaded re the shorter proline here, and then went on to um, drain the choroidal. So placed an AC maintainer um, and made a large pyridomy. And then focused on the inferior quadrants. That's where the largest choroidals were. A little bit of a wet field cautery. And then you're going to mark the sclera four millimeters back from the limbus, pars plana, and make a partial thickness scleral groove with a diamond step knife. So that's what this is here. And then carry that dissection down um, while spreading open the partial thickness groove. This is a diamond trifacet blade. And what you're looking for is, you know, the pigment of the choroid, right? And one, as soon as you get to that plane, there's going to be a rush of fluid. And so with Dr. Chaya's hands here, it's also helpful doing this alone is difficult, but you can see there's someone holding open the groove and then someone carefully dissecting down and, and whacking away blood. And so as you get to that pigment, there's just a rush of fluid there. And this is real time. So that spilled out for about a full minute. Um, and then we repeated the process in the other quadrant, but for the interest of time, I won't include that here. And so during that same surgery, we did a valve in her, her better seeing eye, her right eye. The difference is here, you know, we, we failed by partially attenuating that tube in her first eye. So we actually fully ligated the tube with a um, dissolvable vicral suture in the right eye. In the urgency, which was her first surgery, we also didn't pulse dose her systemic steroid. She was at five milligrams, kind of a maintenance dose, but we decided to bump it up to 60 for the second eye. And you can see kind of what her pressure did here. This is after that second surgery. So the left eye, the hypotenuse eye with that plug went immediately up to 20 um, and then kind of hovered and then actually went up to 40. And then we brought her back to the ER just to take that suture out and then has done very well since then. The right eye, even with fully ligating that tube, still went hypotenuse down to about five and remained there in aqueous shutdown until even three weeks after surgery, where she finally came up and both eyes have now equilibrated about 10. And I don't think, I think she may be on one aqueous suppressant, but not on much for drops. Her baseline vision was there, as I mentioned earlier. With all the surgeries she got in that left eye, her cornea didn't like it. So she actually got a DSEC with Dr. Mifflin recently. And after that DSEC, you can see her, her vision is actually better than what it was preoperatively, despite all that. And so I wanted to make a little bit point of hypotony in these uveitic eyes, because that was kind of the focus of this case. The ciliary shutdown is real and it's multifactorial. Many of these patients are on Diamox and CAIs for a long time before surgery. So they're aqueous suppressed preoperatively. They're hyposecreting at baseline. Then you do a big surgery and their ciliary body just does not want to produce aqueous. The pulse dose prednisone, I think, is generally accepted to reduce ciliary body inflammation. There's not a lot of data to surround that, but it certainly seemed to help in this case. Um, and that brings to question, should we be doing some sort of intraoperative steroid with incisional surgery? There was a group um, that presented an abstract at Arvo that showed similar rates of hypotony with uveitic and non-uveitic eyes doing an amid valve, but only when intra-op steroid was used with the valve. They didn't really say where that steroid was put, what type it was. With all of our tubes here, we tend to do betamethasone or even Kenalog over the plate. Um, so we do some sort of intraoperative steroid, but you also have a double-edged surge there as well because you might reduce the capsule over the plate and then prolong hypotony as well. In this case, we fully ligated that second tube so there may be some benefit to that and just allowing the eye to wake up before the tube actually is flowing. But it was a, it was a learning case for sure with this eye shutting down. So in summary, UV glaucoma is complex. There's multiple overlapped mechanisms of high ILP. It's a very labile, aggressive, often necessitates incisional surgery. Tube shunts are most commonly used, but you can consider a trap if the eye is very quiet. And then post-op hypotony, as we saw, is common and you can combat that with systemic steroid and tube ligation if you need to. Happy to take questions, comments. I don't know how much time I used, but okay.
Any questions? I draw some. Norm, we can sit at an update you on all of this, but uh, in Dave Precise's lab, they've been working on this trip before the others. Uh, there's, there's a, a company that's been formed that you know, they have a, a, a you know product that's incredibly effective but with glauconics using ex vivo human trajectory meshwork uh, the the trip before blockage is in place so it's incredibly powerful specifically for stores it, it worked well when I was by that one it would just reliably bring it back baseline there's some evidence that uh, animal work that, that actually redoes some of that uh, reconstruction of the Network that produces chronic steroid protocol. No, short term, reverse, long term, it's permanent. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some real hope in there. There are pre trials set, a set up now working really hard with this. Brown will be the one who'll do their you know, phase one and phase two, and we're hoping we're not too far down the road. Uh, we're over in a year, it's probably 18 months, but it, it's coming pretty close. Mm -hmm. That's very exciting. Yes, I just want to make one other comment because um, you talk mainly about tubes and traps, uh, uveitic patients. Is the Zen because they're so popular and ubiquitous that that people will see them? It's kind of like in between a trap and tube, uh, but it can kind of go the same way. Uh, I had an experience where I put a Zen in in a patient I thought was previously quiet and a uveitic patient, and it shut down in like one or two months. And you can still have high rates of hypotony with that too as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very true. I just gonna make one dogmatic statement that you can ignore if you want to, but um, this brings a point. There's, you know, do you operate on the worst eye first or, and I've heard many times people call me, you know, I'm operating on the better eye because that's the one that's got the most to lose. I categorically disagree with that. I always operate on the worst eye first and I've never been sorry. You, you look at this case right here, what we learned from the first eye and how we modified our procedure for her better second eye. Just imagine if that were reversed and we would have got this, the first eye result on the better eye. I'm just saying, Ed, I've never been sorry for operating on the, the worst eye first, even if I have to do them very sequentially. I have many memories of one in particular, of just bilateral two patient pressures of 50 OU. We did one late Friday night. We saw them on Saturday, made sure that looked okay. A tube tolerated well. Did the next one Sunday morning? No, and uh, so it just felt so much better about it. Anyway, just something to think about. Him, take it away. So shifting gears a little bit, so I'm here to talk about ocular pain in patients with glaucoma. So no financial disclosures. So we have a 25-year-old female who was an urgent referral, of course, on the weekend from an outside provider with 10 out of 10 right eye pain, dull aching pain radiating to the uh, around the orbit, to the back of the head. Recently had surgery about a week ago. No past medical history, um, relatively healthy. She's on uh, cycloplegia, antibiotics, steroids, and the works for glaucoma medications. Um, and then she's also been on Norco for the past about two months. Um, social history, she lives at home. She has an infant. She stopped breastfeeding in December 2023 um, when she had to start Diamox for an episode, which I'll get into, and otherwise no toxic habits. So all kind of done elsewhere. In 2013, she is a high myope. She had a MAC on regmatogenous uh, retinal detachment, got a parts plane of vitrectomy and a buckle. The next year, she developed a cataract in which a complex cataract surgery was uh, performed and a sulcus IOL was placed. In December of 2023, she came in for an urgent visit with about 7 out of 10 eye pain. Pressures were into the 30s. There was lots of cell and pigment in the AC, and she had a dislocated IOL um, and suspected to have UGG syndrome. Um, was conservatively managed first to control the inflammation, and then in January decided to have an IOL exchange. Um, so a we, we got the notes from the uh, referring doctor, and apparently as they were removing the IOL, they had to abort the case because they wrote an expulsive hemorrhagic choroidal occurred. Um, so at that point, they did not finish with the exchange. All suture, uh, incisions were sutured, and the case was aborted. Um, the patient was managed conservatively in the outpatient, pain medication, heavy dose, topical steroids um, until wow. February of 2024, uh, referred to a retinal doctor um, was uh, for choroidal drainage because the choroidal hemorrhage was still present. On post-up day one, pain was a little bit better from 10 out of 10 to 7 out of 10. 
visual acuity was uh, light perception. Her baseline at this point was probably around 2200 to 2400. Um, IOP was nine. But unfortunately, as the week kind of uh, progressed, uh, pressure started creeping up, um, started going into the 20s, 30s. And then that's when she kind of presented to us. The day before, she had seen her retina doctor who had burped kind of the paracentesis, was able to resolve the pain for about two hours. And then um, the next day was not being able to resolve the pain, even with uh, removal of aqueous from the anterior chamber. And so it was sent to us. So upon encountering the patient, Cole very kindly encountered the patient lying on the ground. Um, and so when finally examined her, left eye pretty much normal, right eye was light perception only, pressures in the 30s, APD by reverse. Her lids were very erythematous, edematous, um, 360 um, injection. Um, cornea had no blood staining, but she did, had a deep layered hyphema in which really only the uh, top 25% of the iris was actually visible. Um, no view was uh, able to be uh, garnered uh, posteriorly. So a B scan was done in uh, conjunction with our retina fellow at the time. And so there was a vitreous hemorrhage and also shallow temporal and inferior hyperreflective material, likely residual hemorrhage from the drainage. Um, but they thought that given everything, recent surgery, probably everything was stable. So mostly it was kind of continued pressure and pain control. She had been on Diamox at this time, but we thought maybe IV Diamox might have better penetration. So she was admitted for IV Diamox pain control and also for hyphema precautions. So she was followed twice daily uh, while inpatient. Um, at that time, her pressure started creeping up into the 40s later on. So AC was tapped, pain was 10 out of 10. On IV Diamox, the pain, uh, the IOP actually improved. The second day we saw her pressures were 22, but her pain was still 10 out of 10. Consulted with our retina team, they thought given the choroidal hemorrhage, maybe starting on some systemic steroids as well would help. Day three, pressure went back up. Uh, hyphema was improving. The eye actually started looking a little bit better. Got a B scan with Dr. Harry, which confirmed and we reviewed it with Dr. Huang and the choroidal hemorrhage looked about the same. Day four and day five, kind of the same thing. We thought maybe let's try some other things in conjunction with the primary team on the inpatient unit started on gabapentin. We switched some topical medications, uh, prednisolone to the preservative free dexamethasone in case some medicamentosa was going on as well. Day five, um, she was actually feeling a little bit better. Pressure was a little bit better today too. Pain was finally an eight and a half out of 10, which was a win. Um, she had gotten three days of IV solumedrol and then transitioned back to PO prednisone and then was on the gabapentin. At this point, she was very motivated to get home to her, her child and potentially maybe even start breastfeeding at some point. So we tried to wean her off opiates. And unfortunately, kind of overnight, pressure kind of remained high, pain shot back up to 10 out of 10. The hyphema appeared to have lysed, and now the anterior chamber was pretty hazy again. Repeat B scan showed some vitreous opacities, increased clot, uh, clot lysis. And then the overnight team had her on pretty much standing dilated at this time. So what do you do? <laughs> so we had a couple different options for the sake of time, not going to kind of pull the audience, but we had could observe just talk about pain management, if this is maybe something else going on, an orphan zen or trabeculectomy in which we would allow that surgery to fail, but just be allowed to kind of control the pressure for some time. Could do a valve tube shunt, but if she would get hypotenuse, might have a worsened bleed, you can do a CPC diode. Um, you could do retrobulbar alcohol, other medication, evisceration, nucleation, but those latter options seemed a bit extreme kind of in this first week of just kind of being with this patient. So what was decided at this point was actually kind of in conjunction with our retina team to kind of go for a pars plana uh, vitrectomy, wash everything out, um, and also do a CPC dial to control the pressure and then an endoscopic exploration. Um, just for those, because we don't see it too, too often. So this is what endo uh, CPC looks like. So you have a 19 gauge cannula that you can put through either a large paracentesis or a main incision. You go under the iris and you're actually able to have an endoscopic view and you can see those ciliary processes. For our case, it wasn't necessarily used to ablate the, the ciliary processes, which can be done, but we actually used it to investigate and see if there was any active bleeding that we could maybe could control. And at the time, if we had the laser, we might be able to laser that as well. 
Fortunately, at the end of the case, um, the retina team evacuated all the blood. Um, there was no active bleeding um, seen on their end. And then we also investigated and there was one area that was a little bit suspicious, but the clot had actually been very stable. And despite watching it for a bit of time, nothing had changed. So we decided to leave the clot and not worsen the bleeding um, and close on up. Um, CPC diode was accomplished for pressure control. So already on post-up day one, pressure starting to improve, pain may be a little bit better, hard to say. And then afterwards, pressure went to six to 10, pain was better, seven out of 10, which was kind of our goal all this time. And she was like, I'm ready to go home. I can go on PO pain medications. And so she knew that she was gonna follow up outpatient, did okay. And then unfortunately, day 15, probably about almost a week later, came in with an urgent visit, 10 out of 10 pain after tapering from her prednisone. Um, IOP was still eight on the eye exam, the AC, the vitreous was pretty quiet. Vision wasn't great because she had a submacular hemorrhage that was stable. Superchoroidal was also stable. She was off glaucoma drops at this time. So we're thinking maybe less likely medicamentosa, but she was still on kind of standing Percocet. So now revisiting the same thing, what do you do with this complex patient? So just going to talk a little bit about ocular pain in patients with glaucoma. Of course, ocular pain is a massive, massive topic that I would direct you to maybe our neuro-ophthalmology colleagues. Um, but just investigating more of the intraocular side of things for the residents, of course, we know that the trigeminal nerve supplies most of the sensory uh, for the eye. And then you have the nasociliary nerve and the branches of the long ciliary and the short ciliary nerves, which do help to innervate short ciliary nerves travel along the choroidal vessels, help to also to contribute parasympathetic fibers, the long ciliary nerves go through the iris, ciliary body, cornea, and also deliver some sympathetic fibers as well. And so looking on the literature, there are three main types of receptors in the eye, and then most studied in the ocular surface because that's the easiest to study. And so that's the mechanoreceptors, the polymodal receptors, and the cold thermal receptors. So the polymodal receptors are about 70% of the pain uh, receptor populations. They're responsible for detecting mechanical, thermal, chemical, and pH change. And so uh, when patients are complaining of burning, stinging type of pain, then that might be activation of these types of receptors. The mechanoreceptors are responding to mechanical mechanical stimuli and are about 15 to 20 percent of the pain receptors and this gives the pricking like sharp type of pain and also are the fastest conductors out of all three. The last one is cold or just a thermal receptor um, in which uh, when temperatures drop below 33 degrees centigrade or a change in tear osmolarity um, induces a discomfort of dryness, um, which can also be seen when patients have evaporative dry eye or also aqueous deficiency as this kind of uh, makes a surface irregular. This is on top of also when you have inflammation on top of the eye from any sort of upset, it releases inflammatory mediators, prostaglandin, substance P, calcitonin gene related peptide amongst other things that also are irritating the surface and generating an inflammatory response. Um, and over the long term might be able to reduce activation thresholds for these receptors, increase excitability and create what is uh, called peripheral sensitization. <laughs> So for me, I really wanted to investigate what is actually causing all the pain in glaucoma. We know that high pr eye pressure causes pain, but no one really had a great explanation why. Looking at the literature, still not a lot of reasons for why that's the case. Um, going back into the 60s um, and they had some animal models of cats and other mammals in which they put microelectrodes on the trigeminal nerve and they realized with an acute rise in IOP, it does kind of stimulate corneal fibers to be firing. Zoazo et al. also found that um, uveal uh, pain receptors had also been firing in cats as well when elevated. The interesting thing that was noted was that when you chronic, when you acutely bring up the pressure, all of those fibers were firing and it's detectable on the electrodes, but when you kind of bring them up very slowly and you leave them at those pressures, those receptors stop firing as much. Um, so this suggests a possible mechanism by which these chronic angle closure types of patients, which we see in clinic all the time, they have very high pressures, but they seem pretty comfortable. And it might be because it's so slow. The other side of things, of course, and which there's much more data about is about the ocular surface. Dr. Zabriskie already talked about it a little bit with the benzalkonium uh, chloride. Uh, we know that all of these things are meant to kind of preserve and kind of be bactericidal. 
where it leaves bacterial static, um, but also that causes cytotoxic effects on the cornea itself. So all those things, those pain receptors, I talked about the inflammatory mediators, these are also implicated um, with preservatives. Uh, BAK is in almost every single drop that we use, um, just included a partial list here. Um, and it has uh, been associated with also increased ocular penetration of these medications, which is why it's uh, been used in so many different types. But as it's kind of decreasing the occludens and um, the epithelial structure, it also allows for degradation and damage to the uh, nerve fibers. And there's been confocal microscopy that does show uh, alterations and decrease in the density of uh, nerve fibers in the cornea with chronic BAK use. So these are some of the other alternative preservatives, Sofzia, Puride, polyquaternarium, sodium percarburate. And you notice that these are also in a lot of the artificial tears that we use. Theoretically, a little bit better, a little bit more friendly to the ocular surface because on contact with the ocular surface, catalase or other uh, cations are able to reduce these and it kind of converts them over to essentially just aqueous or water. Um, so they tend to be more comfortable on, on the eye themselves, though they still can have some toxicity. Glaucoma medications, of course, on their own, we know a little bit more about the bromonidine after today, but also every kind of glaucoma medication does uh, is able to worsen the ocular surface. We know oftentimes affecting MGD, erythema. We know the contact dermatitis and kind of local inflammation that's generated is able to irritate the surface as well. Rokinase inhibitors have the vortex keratopathy in which some patients are very symptomatic in their vision and their pain. And some cholinergic agonists, even though the like pilocarpine systemically is used in some patients with Sjogren's and it's able to increase lacrimation, it may worsen meibomian gland dysfunction. So overall can still irritate the surface. And of course, after we do surgery on these patients, they can get bleb dysesthesia. Um, oftentimes, a lot of this bleb dysesthesia is thought to be because you have a kind of sharp angle, you can form a small corneal delin, also altering kind of the epithelial integrity and overall um, surface. And then uh, the paper by Budenz et al. Um, that first kind of described this also identified like these bubbles that can form just from the irregularity. And those bubbles are uh, also are associated with pain with uh, these blebs. So going back to our patient, so she had an urgent visit with tapering of the prednisone. We bumped back on the prednisone. We had a long, long discussion with the patient, including some of those other, starting to introduce some of those alternative therapies with oculoplastics or retrobulbar medications. But at this time we said, maybe we're not there yet, still pretty early on. Let's get you an urgent visit into our pain management group. And so, she had uh, gone with the pain management group and they started her on hydromorphone every four hours. I still look good about a month later, but pain was nine out of 10 constant. And we were at our wits end, had an in-depth discussion with the patient again, kind of the entire time we're talking about every day, kind of what are her goals of care? She's been light perception in this eye. Best vision was maybe 2,400 a couple months ago. Now she's like, I, my entire life has been disrupted. This is not a life worth living if it's going to be like this. So I rather have the eye out. So at this point, we referred her to oculoplastics for removal of the eye. Of course, if there was any sort of peripheral or central sensitization, there is some neuropathic component. We were like very worried that maybe even after a nucleation evisceration, pain would still be there. But fortunately, a week after a nucleation, she's like, yeah, I'm having some post-surgical pain, but all the pain that I had from inside the eye is completely gone. Done. Um, immediately she self-weaned off opiates, tapered off the steroids after the enucleation and is now following with the ocularis for ocular prosthesis and for, with us for regular monitoring. So just some topics, um, saying that ocular pain can be quite complex. A thoughtful multidisciplinary approach is often needed. Ocular pain in glaucoma patients is not fully understood. Um, a lot of the literature is from mammalian models decades ago. Um, some ocular surface data is available now, and that's kind of the primary uh, data that we have. And a special thank you to the entire glaucoma, retina, and oculoplastics team, because I think we've all kind of worked together on this patient. So yeah, these are my references. And any questions? <laughs> So um, I, I'm a big believer that, and it's quite variable, but uveal pain, because I had a couple of small coronal hemorrhages on the table in which the first thing that noticed was the patient suddenly wincing. Yeah. 
That's Nar shaking his head. You know what I mean? I have it. And I've got, I'm so, I, I was so attuned to that. Immediately, whoa, I didn't see anything. Anyway, it was just kind of a wince. And there's just, I asked what's this? It's just deep pain. And we looked, and there's a little corrosion. So uh, I think that whatever the shearing of the rest is ongoing, yeah. it's amazing how some people can have corrals not have much pain. Yeah. So it's variable, but, but that, that, and it's a, it's a deep pain. They talk about, it's not, most people can differentiate that surface, you know, a pain and they came from, it's a, a deep pain. It's a boring pain. And uh, it seems to persist even as it's getting better. So, and, and it's, it's not minor for these people. I mean, it is really severe. Yeah, great. I mean, Manosaurus told me years ago, anytime there's any blood under the retina, a patient can have pain. And it's, that's absolutely true. And, uh, great case, great case, both of you. And uh, just in closing uh, this case, you know, this is the worst case of pain. You know, it is drug seeking. Obviously, it wasn't. Um, and, um, you know, she was amazing. It's, it's just an interesting point. Her father in law is a lifetime patient of the Moran. I've followed her father in law for. 30 years now with congenital glaucoma and he had a blind painful eye enucleated 30 years ago and understood totally you know i've told people some people with blind painful eyes some of my happiest patients are the one that finally decided to have an eye removed and he was one of those so he was the one who called me you know late one night said my, my daughter-in-law is having so much trouble anyway interesting stories and, and really great cases a lot to deal with uh, thanks everyone for being here and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you.